Good morning. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity uh, to talk by telephone with uh, Pastor Ron Curl. Some of you may uh, recognize that name. Anybody recognize that name? He sends his greetings. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I just thought I'd, I'd pass that along to you. This morning I'd like to go back to the Bible reading and uh, I'll be referring to it uh, as we go through this morning. Uh, a Bible study on hope. Our living hope in Christ that shapes the way that we live. If you have your Bible, you can open it and I'll refer to some uh, verses. I'll be reading from the NIV version and it's uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, one of the questions that I, I like to ask about several uh, Bible passages and certainly we'll ask about this one is, does this particular passage, um, is it relevant to us today? Does it pertain to us? And if so, how? Uh, those who study the ancient texts of the Bible tell us that this particular letter was written between 60 and 65 AD, which happened to coincide with something that was uh, very important for the church in that day. It was the beginning of the Roman government's persecution, active persecution of Christian believers. And that uh, was the time frame in which this particular letter was written. There's a clear geographical marker in verse 1, uh, that indicates that the recipients of the letter were living uh, in the Roman Empire in these uh, various provinces that were mentioned, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And then uh, Peter also, along with that particular geographical marker, gives a description of the people that he's writing to. And there's a quite a, a number of descriptions in verses 1 and 2. First of all, he said they're God's elect. Secondly, exiles. They were living away from their home country. And uh, I, I don't think all the people that were scattered throughout that part of the Roman Empire had been displaced from their home countries. I think he was referring to the fact that as Christians, they were no longer home. They were passing through and looking for another home. The third thing he said is that they were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Thirdly, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, uh, to, to be, be obedient to, to the Lord Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Not physically, but metaphorically. Being sprinkled with the blood is a reference to cleansing from the Old Testament sacrifices, and that is symbolically what Christ does to us as believers as well. So, as we look at the, the description that, that Peter gives to these people, we realize that, yes, it fit them as Christian believers, but it also fits us as Christian believers today. It's as true for us today, this particular description of Christ and our relationship to Christ as it was to them in that day. So yes, I think that there are lots of things that we can learn. Uh, we, we can be included in what Peter is doing here. Now this particular letter is a fascinating letter. We don't have time to, to do uh, the whole letter today, obviously. We'll only get a uh, start at the first chapter. But it actually has 50 imperatives, approximately 50 imperatives. What are imperatives? Imperatives are a, a form of speech, if, if you know grammar. I don't know grammar, but somebody told me that an imperative is a command. It's, a, it's telling you what to do. And so Peter, throughout this letter, is telling the Christians how to live the Christian life. Um, imperatives are not things that we often like. We don't like people telling us what to do. But sometimes uh, imperatives are absolutely necessary. When Johnny's running after his uh, ball that's going across the street and, uh, and there's a car coming, that is a good time for an imperative uh, form of speech. Without even thinking about it, what do we say to Johnny as he's running out on the street? Stop! Don't take another step. Your life is in danger. But the, the word is stop. Don't go there because it's, it's very necessary. It's, it's a very simple form of speech, relatively easy to understand. And, and Peter was a practical guy. So uh, having been a fisherman, I think that's why he uses so many imperatives. So I, I like to call the study of this book uh, Peter's Pastoral Imperatives. After all, Peter was a pastor. He was told by Jesus to look after the sheep and to care for his lambs, and he was doing his pastoral duty. We don't have time to, uh, <clears throat> to go through all those pastoral imperatives in the letter today, but we'll get to the first one that starts in verse 13, chapter 1 to 13, all the way to 
through to 514. It's a fascinating study to do that sometime. But today I just want to focus on the first chapter where Peter really isn't into telling us yet what to do until he hits uh, verse 13 or gets that far. Before telling the believers of his day what they had to do and how to live the Christian life under pressure from their culture, uh, under this coming persecution <clears throat> from the Roman government, he began to shape in their minds their identity. Peter had some important truth to tell them about who they were, really were in Christ. You see, today we tend to look inward to find our identity. Let's find our true self, and, and we want to find out who we are inside. But there's a certain amount of truth that comes to us from outside ourselves, especially when we're in Christ. There are things that <clears throat> are important and shape our identity from Christ that we receive from him, and that's what Peter wanted to tell them about this. The word salvation appears three times in this passage that was read, and I think uh, looking at this, uh, the, the context of these three times that salvation is used, it kind of, for me, helped to unlock some of the, um, the uh, truth about this particular passage of Scripture. In verse 5, salvation uh, says, it says this, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So there is an aspect of salvation, according to Peter, that's future, that will be fully and totally revealed when the Lord Jesus comes again. He hasn't come yet a second time. So there's a part of salvation that's waiting to be revealed fully and completely at the second coming of the Lord. In verse 9, it says again, salvation, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's a present tense. There are present aspects of our salvation that we are receiving now. And Peter will go into some detail in just a while. We'll see how Peter uh, understands the present reality that we are living. In verse 10, it says this, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. So that time, in verse 10, there's a backward look, the, the historical or the past look at salvation. Salvation has a long history because ever since sin entered the, 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 the world through Adam and Eve, God has been working on his plan of salvation for the world. And you and I have a past as well that connects us to God's salvation plan or plan of salvation. That important past was the moment that we received the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we were connected by faith to Christ, but also to the great, wonderful, eternal plan of God when we trusted the Lord and became part of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it says in verse 3, the last part of verse 3, in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope <clears throat> through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So that's what happened to us. That's our connecting point with the great historical plan of salvation that has uh, that, that, that God is, is working out. And we are in not only connected to it through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're also active participants in it. So let's look a little more at the past uh, dimension of salvation that you and I are living, part of our reality. Our hope that we have is anchored in the history of God's dealing with the human race ever since he began dealing with the human race and also his dealings with you and me. God has always been dealing with you and with me throughout our lives. Our salvation has been God's plan from the beginnings, from the beginning uh, of creation. The central focus of God's plan of salvation, of course, is the Lord Jesus, his son. The central act of God's salvation was Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And Peter says that on the basis of the resurrection, we have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. And so those of us who have trusted him, have asked uh, him to forgive our sins, who have promised to obey him and follow him, are included in this great plan of salvation. And, and, and verse 4 indicates that we have been given an inheritance of eternal life that is, in, that is kept in heaven for us until Christ comes again. And this inheritance is an inheritance that, according to Peter, is secure. It will not perish. It will not spoil. It will not fade. It's totally guaranteed 
and secure for us. So that's the past dimension. The present is an interesting study here because there are several descriptions that, Paul, that Peter, I just about said Paul, um, I really mean Peter. Uh, so if you hear me say Paul, just think uh, he's talking really about Peter. So there are nine descriptions that Peter gives us about the present situation in which we are living. Now he was telling them uh, almost 2,000 years ago that that was their condition. But these conditions also and situations also apply to us. First of all, it says, we are shielded by God's power through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Verse 5, first part. The ESV says that we are guarded by God's power. Without God's protection in our lives, we simply would not survive spiritually. But God keeps us and protects us and shields us from the enemy so that we can thrive and live a spiritual life. Secondly, he said, we greatly rejoice in the knowledge of God's protection and our future inheritance in heaven. Verse 6, we greatly rejoice. One of the reasons that we come together on a weekly basis, usually on a weekly basis, is to praise and to worship God, to express the joy and our gratefulness that we have to God. That's part of what we are as, a, as believers in Christ. There is this uh, aspect of rejoicing who, in who God is and what God has done. Thirdly, in verse uh, 6, the second part of it, we suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We are afflicted by trouble, troubles. And these kinds of troubles can be related to so many different things in our lives, whether health or economics or personal relationships or, or aging, you name it. There's all kinds of sources for the trouble that we face in our life. And Jesus was honest about it. He said, in this world you will have trouble or affliction, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I read a book uh, about two months ago by Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot was a, uh, a famous author. She was a missionary in Ecuador back in the 50s. Her husband was one of the five martyrs that were killed in 19, I think it was 56, by the Auca Indians. Uh, they were trying to reach them. But anyway, uh, after her death in 2015, there was a book published in her name in 2018, but based on a seminar that she had given a number of years before her death. And it was based, uh, it was focused on the theme of suffering. The title of the book is Suffering is Never for Nothing. If you have a chance to read it, I would say it would be a great read. But here's what she said about suffering, and I have a quote, uh, and uh, just to read from this book. <clears throat> there have been some hard things in my life, of course, as there have been in yours. And I cannot say to you, I know exactly what you're going through. But I can say that I know the one who knows. And I've come to see that it's through the deepest suffering that God has taught me the deepest lessons. And if you'll trust him for it, we can come out, through the, uh, come out to the unshakable assurance that he is in charge. He has a loving purpose and he can transform something terrible into something wonderful. Suffering is never for nothing. I hope that would whet your appetite enough to go and get the book and read it. Suffering is never for nothing. So Peter was very uh, realistic about the situation in which people were living then and in, in which we live too. Uh, there will be grief from all kinds of trouble. Grief, of course, brings us through a grieving process and a grieving process in our lives or the, 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 the various grieving processes move us on towards maturity and help us to mature in Christ. Although they're not pleasant, they're not easy, they're, they are important things in our lives. Then fourthly, after the troubles, Peter talks about <clears throat> that our current suffering proves that our faith is genuine. In Peter's time, gold was purified by heating it up and melting it, and, and any impurities that were there would float to the top and they would skim it off, and that's the way that, that gold was purified. And he uses that image for us. In the same way that gold is purified, we are mature and become genuine through the trials of suffering. Our difficulties and our troubles serve a positive purpose. And, and the fifth thing that he says uh, in verse 7, the last, second part of verse 7, our faith is much more precious 
than gold or any earthly asset. Our faith connects us to eternity and to the inheritance that is waiting in heaven for us. What would you trade here on earth for your faith? If somebody said, give up your faith and I'll give you a million dollars, you might think, hey, I've got it made. A million dollars? I mean, wouldn't that be just great? And, and I, I would have it made as far as this, this earth goes and, and as far as this life. But what about eternity? There's nothing that we can take with us except us as we move into the presence of God when death touches our, our bodies and when it's time for us to go. There's nothing, nothing more precious in this world than our faith because it connects us to that personal relationship with the Lord that takes us on into eternity and to an eternal life that's more wonderful than we can ever imagine. And then Peter says something interesting. Uh, we love Jesus even though we have not seen him, verse 8a. So how can we love someone we've never seen? Well, it, it just happens that Jesus is not absent. We've never seen him personally, bodily, but he's not absent. His presence is with us. His Holy Spirit lives in us, and we know his presence. We know the sense of his presence. We have his word. We can read his teaching, and we, have, uh, we receive guidance and instruction from his word. And we have this thing that's called a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, and that's why we love him because we have come to know him. Not only do we love him, Peter says, but we believe in him. We believe in Jesus even though we haven't seen him. Now, uh, I think for Peter that was probably quite amazing because Peter knew Jesus. He met him physically. He lived with him, w walked with him, uh, worked with him for maybe three years. And so he had a, a solid personal eyewitness uh, testimony of who, a witness and testimony of who Jesus was. But the people that he, were deal, he was dealing with after, and Peter is now writing 30 years on into his Christian life, uh, 30 years after Jesus had told him to feed his sheep, 30 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven. So, so most of the people that Peter had been dealing with for these 30 years, and certainly now when he's writing this letter, had never, never seen Jesus had never been close to where Jesus was. Most of them were scattered across the world in different, different uh, places. And so for Peter, I imagine that was pretty amazing. To see the same love and the same faith that was in his heart for the Lord Jesus among these people who had never seen him. And that's where we are. We've never seen Jesus personally. But we know his presence and we can believe in him and we love him. And it says in verse, uh, the last part of verse 8, we are filled with an inexpressible and a glorious joy. Joy is real. It helps sustain us through our troubles. And joy comes from the presence of God. King David said it so well. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 1611. So it's the presence of God that brings us this joy. And then Peter uh, finishes off this present uh, aspect, dimension of the hope that we have by saying that we are now receiving the end result of our faith, the salvation of our souls. It's God is actively working in our lives today, perfecting our salvation, bringing us to maturity, spiritual maturity. He's changing us. And he says we're receiving the salvation of our souls. It's not our bodies that are going to make it to heaven. We're going to leave them here. But our souls, our, our inner being, our self, will go on and we'll be given a new body and we will live eternally in heaven. So God is using us throughout this time to touch other people's lives, to mature ourselves and bring other people into contact with the gospel and with the Lord Jesus Christ. So briefly, let's look now at the future. We've seen the past, we've seen the present, and there is a future to our salvation. The future dimension means that we have a destiny. We're going somewhere. And we're looking forward with anticipation to the complete fullness of our salvation when Jesus comes again. Verse 4 says we have an inheritance 
that's waiting for us in heaven. Our salvation, verse 5b, will be fully revealed in the last time when Jesus comes again. And our faith that has been proven genuine through suffering will result in, verse 7, praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed at his second coming. So we have a lot to look forward to. The best days of our life are to come. Anybody say amen? amen. Even if you're, well, not too old, maybe 80 or so, still, the best days of your life, I'm not there yet, the best days of your life are ahead. It may not seem like it, but it's true. The future is better than everything, anything with Christ, is better than anything we've lived to this point, and we can look forward to that. So Peter tells us in verse 13 how we can activate this living hope in our lives today. How can it become more real? When we listen to the depressing news and we argue about the, uh, the convoys and the protests and we do all those things that happens to us as Canadians, how do we get over it all? How do we get through it all? Well, there's a hope. There's a hope that God is working his plan, his will in us, through us, and among us. And Peter says you need to have a new mindset. You need to put your mind in gear. He said uh, in, in the original, it's goida, uh, uh, gird up the loins of your mind. What he's referring to was back in the day when men wore these long robes, they weren't exactly uh, comfortable for running. You had to gather them all up and then you could run or you could go and do something, uh, uh, an activity that you were going to do. And Peter said you need to do the same thing with your minds. You need to get ready. You need to put your, your mind in gear and think about something. Use the God-given capability of thinking that God has given to you and think about something. What will be the grace, the favor that comes to us when Jesus comes again? Think about those things. What will it be like when Jesus comes again? We will see him face to face. I can give you a short list. Uh, we'll, we'll be reunited with those who have gone before us by physical death, those who believe in Christ. We will participate in a world that is free from sin and the curse. We will live forever as God had originally intended us to live before sin entered the world and damaged it. There are so many things if we just think about it and make a list. We can even glean through the scriptures the things it says in Revelation. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more night. What will be there and what won't be there? Those are amazing things that we can think about. And that's the way, Peter says, you can activate or reactivate your hope for the future. Think about it. What will it be like when Jesus comes again? And that gives us the perspective to be able to live our lives today in the light of eternity. We need to live today in the light of the future, of what's coming, not the past. Now, there are many good things that we can learn from the past, but our orientation is a hope-filled orientation for the future of what we're heading to and what God is doing to get us there. May God help us to have a living hope Take some time in the next week or so and sit down quietly and, and think and make a list. Maybe in your mind or maybe write it out. What, are, what will it really be like when Jesus comes again? And that's the hope that we are moving toward. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Lord bless you.